Thank you. So I'm Isalt, um, and I'm going to first tell you about the story of when I started talking about the chilling effect, because I think there's probably a lot of people in the room uh, who weren't around for that. That was a very Irish thing. And it was back in 2020 when actually we couldn't talk about anything about this. Um, and what happened was that a bunch of about 20 of our top NGOs, including the National Women's Council of Ireland and most of the LGBT organizations, migrants' rights, but also Amnesty, signed a letter that demanded that politicians and media deny legitimate representation to people like us that think biology is material in the world, and particularly material in the sex class, in the class of people who are women and who get discriminated against based on the fact that they're women. And having published that letter, I was actually giving a workshop that weekend on eating disorders because eating disorders is a lot of the work I do as a psychotherapist. And I watched this unfold on Twitter and the letter was horrific. It was, it was just so totalitarian and so unbased in any kind of reality and had nothing to do with a plural society. And I had thought that we were creating a plural society in Ireland. Um, and I watched this unfold on Twitter and people responding to Amnesty and responding to the organizations. And finally, at the end of the weekend, I think it was published on Friday, and I think about the Sunday evening, I was watching all of this and two Irish women spoke up and the CEO of Amnesty totally dismissed them. These are all just UK women who don't know anything. They're just turfs from the outside coming in and being bigots. And these were two Irish women. They were two Irish therapists. I didn't know either of them at the time, but they both said they worked within the community and had supported the community for years. And they spoke up. And he didn't respond to them. He just completely ignored them. <laughs> and I finally thought, okay, I've had enough here. And because my grandfather, Sean McBride, was a founder of Amnesty, I tweeted. I said, this is not what my grandfather stood for when he set up Amnesty. And I possibly would have left it at that, <laughs> except Colm O'Gorman, who's the CEO, was CEO of Amnesty at the time, said, Isolt, did you read the letter? <laughs> I'm like, I read it five times, dude. <laughs> and so then I started my I read the letter hashtag, which was great fun. And I went to bed that night and I woke up the next morning and my Twitter had exploded, uh, which wasn't, I hadn't expected that. And I still had Colm O'Gorman doubling down and <laughs> just don't double down with me. It's never going to work very well. So we had a long ongoing battle and, and included in that, I managed to get the Irish Times to publish a letter about this. And again, they took about three or four days to decide, but it's very difficult in Ireland when the granddaughter of Sean McBride, who's also the great granddaughter of the major John McBride, who was executed for his part in 1916, and who's also a member of the LGBTQ community, uh, speaks up about it. So they did finally publish my letter, which of course was very carefully worded, but said this was a chilling effect. So that's how the chilling effect became part of my narrative within in this area. But to talk about the chilling effect on clinicians, I want to tell you about those two therapists who I since met and got to know very well. But also to say that when... <laughs> When Stella emailed me and said, Isol, I'm doing this conference. Will you come talk about the chilling effect on clinicians? And I, I, I was like, took two minutes, three minutes, maybe five minutes going, yeah. Because I have to think about the chilling effect on me professionally, where I choose to speak, what I choose to speak about, and how I respond to things. And of course, clearly I said yes, and I'm delighted to be here. And I think the work that Stella is doing is fabulous. And Stella and I are quite clear, we don't always agree on everything, but we're always really open about that. And that's how life should be. But back to those two therapists. One of them, I can't say a lot about her story because it's very ongoing at the moment. But she wrote with Stella an op-ed in the Irish Times 
which was titled Bill to Ban Conversion Therapy Poses Problems for Therapists. As a result, um, a bunch of organizations got together to boycott the Irish Times. And now while they wouldn't have had any significant financial impact on the Irish Times, it is absolutely the case that since that boycott, the Irish Times really won't publish anything uh, that would be critical or questions this. But she in her own life, and I can't say very much about it, but to, to say she's being persecuted would not be an unreasonable description of what's happening to her. And I'm very mindful that Lisa is coming up to talk too about, you know, the responses to her research, research that was absolutely valid. There are no methodological flaws in the research. And yet what we have is institutions who are giving ethical approval for research, just not willing to go there. We have journals who are backing down when papers have been properly peer reviewed and when there is no flaws, despite publishing <laughs> the most appalling research from, from the other side at times. Not all of that research is bad, but there are so many methodological flaws in a lot of the research that's published. And so this has a completely chilling effect on people's capacity to do research in the area. And it's whenever they give that ground to activists, as opposed to just saying, actually, this research is good, it was peer reviewed, and it was ethical. But once they give ground, they cause reputational damage to the person. And it's a horrific thing for people to go through. So there is really a huge chilling effect here. And part of it is because the activists are so dogged and determined. And it's been interesting because I've been involved in a couple of conversations with some of the NGOs. And the NGOs themselves, when you talk to them, can be quite reasonable and want things to go, research to be done, things to happen. But once the activists outside get involved, they bow down to that. And they're too afraid of going up against their own activists. But on to the other therapist. I want to tell you a little more about her story. And the really, <laughs> she, it's really strange. She, she was in the room. Well, I'm gonna come back to the room she was in. Let me tell you a bit about her cancellation first. But she was in the room and I'll tell you what that room was. But in 2018, and she's a therapist that works with couples, with queer couples, with women, and with sort of uh, sex, sex therapy, relationship therapy. And she organized a retreat for women. Um, that was, you know, about getting in touch with your cycles and nature and a bunch of stuff like that. I don't really, I don't really know. I didn't know her then. It's probably not the retreat I would have gone on, but that's, you know, that's fine. But it was clearly a retreat for women, right? It wasn't a retreat that included trans women despite there being some number of trans women who seem to think abdominal pain is menstruating. But, uh, but she got completely cancelled and ostracised and actually ended up leaving Ireland and works abroad now. The room she was in, the room she was in, she was chairman, chairperson, whatever, of an organization called Lesbians Organizing Together in the late 90s and early 2000s. She was instrumental in creating visibility within the community. She was embedded in the community, a part of it had worked in the community. And all of those people uh, just stepped away from her. She was just a turf and they destroyed her livelihood as well. She had to go away and create another livelihood for herself. So it doesn't matter what your credentials are and how much you've done, uh, you can still be canceled. I mean, at the time, <laughs> at the time when I was speaking up, I mean, yes, I doubled down and I went for it, but it was a really difficult and challenging decision to make because I had literally just then been informed that I was going to be offered a post that I had really wanted, but I was waiting for confirmation from the minister. 
And uh, I thought, oh, <laughs> that's probably going to be gone now. And yet, during the middle of that whole thing, actually, the minister did get in touch. And I swear, I've never gushed so much at anybody. And I don't normally gush. I was like, yes, minister. Yes, minister. I definitely will take that. Thank you very much. Please don't look at my Twitter right now. <laughs> uh, but so that chilling effect is very, very real. And I see, like Stella was talking about, I see, I see therapists absolutely paralyzed about doing this work, paralyzed about how to approach it. I think also a little bit paralyzed about what is gender identity versus sexual orientation versus, say, the gender expression aspect of things. And so afraid of using their normal good therapy skills, just basic therapy skills, uh, to, to work with clients who are in distress. And because the real thing here is most people don't come to therapy because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender identity. They come because they're distressed, right? So people come because they're distressed. You work with the distress that's in the room. You know, you don't have to focus on these other things. You just work with the whole person that sits in front of you. But I think one of the real problems in trying to talk about this in forums like Twitter or for instance, an op-ed in the Irish Times, is that therapy is a complex process. And finding the words to describe the way we do that to people who aren't therapists is challenging. So I like to try and you know, look at ways forward in all of this, as opposed to just being cross about what's happening. Um, so I just want to describe an experience of a good colleague of mine, Sally, who's down there in the audience, who is a, yet another fabulous psychotherapist I've met through, through this situation. And she recently attended Stella's workshop uh, back, in, back in the autumn on working with gender distress. And she wrote a review for one of the psychotherapy accreditation bodies in Ireland, their journal. Um, and I think the response that she got is, it's really important to look at the response she got. She got a couple, two, two negative responses that are exactly the kinds of ones you could expect. But she got, I tried to count them up, 15 really positive responses. And this is before the journal had gone online. And I can't read them all out, but let me just read for example. Sorry, as I mess with my phone. Dear Sally, I'm sure you agonized before hitting send on this piece, but I'm so glad you did. I've been so frightened of speaking my mind, of working with anything to do with gender, in fact. I'm even a little nervous of sending this, but it's time for us to speak up. I feel encouraged by your piece. It's good to know that if I speak as a therapist, I'm not alone voice. Thank you for speaking up and daring to do this review. So what I think we can all take from this is, I don't think these are conversations to have on Twitter. So if people try to engage with me with this stuff on Twitter and they keep doing it, I just mute them and I don't respond. That's not the place to be having complex conversations, right? I only use Twitter to disseminate research and analyze research about these things. But there are lots of forums where we can have thoughtful conversations and we can make thoughtful contributions. And if you're a psychotherapist or a clinician, I can't speak to what it's like for doctors, but as, as therapists, you need to be in the room. You need to be talking to your bodies about what's going on. You need to, you know, you need to open up conversations and really work to create a space where, where we're using those skills we have as therapists of listening and holding space. And as Sue said earlier, of containing. We need to be containing some of the outrage and the fear. Uh, and we need, to be able to, we need to be able to contain it ourselves to do that. And I think that when we, as individuals, 
are able to contain that distress and that rage for the people around us, we can create spaces where these conversations can happen. And it's important to be doing that. So if you are, <laughs> and you're right to be afraid of the chilling effect, because all it takes, and I think sometimes, I think sometimes people who aren't in our position maybe don't understand this, but all it takes is one complex, vexatious complaint to really derail our livelihoods. You know, we don't, most of us are working in private practice. We don't have any kind of employment cover. We, we are making a living, you know, month to month. I'm not saying, it, I'm not saying we're impoverished, but like we are, we are, you know, my friend that was canceled in Ireland and she literally, she couldn't work in Ireland anymore. She moved countries. She doesn't live here anymore. She couldn't, she couldn't find work here after that. So to be fearful of the chilling effect is absolutely valid, right? In, in, in this arena. And with the level of sort of malicious and vexatiousness out there. So for instance, when I first spoke up about the chilling effect, I got at least three requests for psychotherapy that just gave me the ick. <laughs> Now they really set off my they really set off my alarm signals. There was just something so off in the requests. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, maybe these people are okay and maybe they really need help. But you know what? Another therapist can help them. So I just referred them on. But that really happened. And I'm not somebody that, you know, I don't I don't really get that very easily. You know, there was something really off in these requests. So to be afraid of the chilling effect is valid, but we've got to contain our own fear and we've got to go back to those things that we have, which is a sense of our own values, our own clarity about adolescent development. You know, there is clear adolescent developmental paths. There's no reason to hive off this gender thing as the one thing, the one thing that our children know exactly who they are and what they are in, when we, we particularly know that adolescents try on identities. That's part of adolescent development, to try on different identities, to check them out, to play with them, to learn about yourself. And what we do see is, you know, I have one young friend who's a lesbian, and she went to belong to, which is one of our NGOs here for LGBT youth. And out of the 18 young people in her cohort, where she was the only one who ended up with having just a really boring vanilla identity like lesbian, right? All the others had some kind of interesting gender identity um, added on to their sexuality, but even sexuality wasn't spoken about, really gender was where the focus was. But out of that 18, only two remain with any kind of non-binary or trans identity. This is what I mean. Adolescents try on identities. So we've got to, we've got to be the adults in the room. You know, we just have to be the adults in the room. That doesn't mean you need to put yourself out there as a target for cancelling. That'd be daft, right? When, <laughs> when I spoke up about the chilling effect, and you can go and read it because I just retweeted it on my Twitter. I did this thread, which was <laughs> pulled rank with all of my illustrious relatives that have contributed to creating the state that we live in as Ireland. And oh my God, I really doubled down on that thread. So if you're going to come after me, you know, you were going after somebody whose great grandfather had died for the country. <laughs> executed. And in fact, the activists started calling me the amnesty princess afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, just to say, start containing those feelings, those projections, contain your own distress, contain the projections from out there. They are massive, but you've got to be able to contain them and find the spaces where you can start to have thoughtful conversations about these things. So that's really it for me today. <laughs>